we organize people of color, women, the LGBTQ community, um, and immigrants especially in Lynn, Worcester, Springfield, and Holyoke. Um, and our core mission is really to move um, the new majority from passive spectators of what's happening around us um, to being more active participants in the discussion around um, environmental justice, around housing justice, around racism and inequality in Massachusetts. Um, and so our movement strategy is really centered around community organizing. I came out of student organizing at UMass Amherst um, and Neighbor to Neighbor's bread and butter is door-to-door -door canvassing. We still do do door-to-door -door canvassing from April to November. Um, and the key there is to actually talk to um, community residents in those gateway cities to hear what are the major issues that are coming up for them, um, and especially the intersections that kind of those bread and butter kitchen table issues have with climate. So we hear a lot of people talking about housing and gentrification, um, but they also talk about energy bills and the need for weatherization and the need for energy efficiency and heat pumps. Um, and from that kind of broad uh, community outreach, we go deep and really invest in the leadership of our members so that they're the ones that are actually taking um, the leadership and the reins of the local campaigns that they launch in the local chapters. Um, and so just a little bit more background as to Neighbor to Neighbor and some of the campaigns that we've done. We've, we closed the Mount Tom Coal Plant in 2014 um, and transitioned that site into one of the largest solar farms in Massachusetts. Um, we stopped this biomass plant in Springfield along with a, a very, very big coalition. Uh, both of those were 10 year long campaigns. Um, and I will just say that Massachusetts has no more coal fired power plants. And so it is possible. <laughs> it is absolutely possible as um, Advisor McCarthy said for um, local campaigns and local change to be amplified um, nationally and even um, internationally. Um, so that's just a little bit about neighbor to neighbor. That, that, that is uh, great. And again, uh, Fletcher School, Tufts kids, they, know, they don't agonize, they organize. Okay? That's, <laughs> that's what we like about you. You know what you're doing. Uh, and, uh, and that's what makes change possible. So let's go to Cabell. Talk about 350.org and uh, uh, the Better Future Project. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you, Tufts, for having me here. Um, as Senator said, I am Cabell Eames, and I work with 350 Mass Better Future Project. And our mission, our theory of change, is one that is rooted in intersectionality, liberation. And when you work with a predominantly white group that is climate, uh, we don't have the best reputation. We've been around for a long time. Sierra Club, Greenpeace, they've all been around for a long time, and I don't need to tell you that um, we have kept a lot of people out, and that's why we keep losing. So my organization, after Senator Markey filed a Green New Deal, it gave us a building block to be able to work with frontline communities, because we've always worked in coalition but it gave us something to really build on, and it gave us something to imagine, right? Mm -hmm. And so that is intersectional work that is collaborative, but that really centers base building. And base building, when I say that, I mean communities. What Neighbor to Neighbor is doing is what we all should be doing every day for every issue, mm -hmm. because climate is one of those issues that I don't need to tell you is really scary and really overwhelming. But I had a mother that was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis when I was in elementary school. I grew up in a BIPOC community in Virginia that was sandwiched between Philip Morris and DuPont. And a lot of people had autoimmune diseases. And I can't tell you the hope that that neighborhood had that was, it, it was awestruck. It was like, you know, I thought my world was ending but everyone around me said, no, 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 it's not, because we've got you. And that is what the climate movement needs and how they need to think, that we've got you. You don't look like me, I don't care, I've got you. Oh, you know your neighborhood? Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna train you, I'm a subject expert, I'm an engineer, I'm gonna tell you how to talk about these things to your neighbors. Because we have concentrated the wealth, we've concentrated the education, 
And we don't need to do that because if we keep doing it, we're gonna keep losing. The, the answer to the climate crisis, in our view, is empowering everybody else. And when we do that, then we elect people like Senator Markey, we elect people like Ocasio-Cortez, and we continue to uplift the issue in solutions, and we continue to uplift the issue that are rooted in jobs, and we continue to uplift the issue that y'all means all. <laughs> That's what I grew up saying, y'all. So for me, it's like, y'all means all, right? We really, we have, to, we have to be rooted in that though. And so Better Future Project, 350 Mass, that's our commitment. And we are lucky enough to be working with Andrea's group, Green Roots, Sunrise, now through what we created, which is called Mass for News Alliance. I'm so proud of that. I get to work with Community Labor United. I get to work with the Boston Building Trades. I get to hear from them what's possible and what I need to do. And then I go back and I educate people that look like me. And that's my job. And that's hard work, but that's my job. Because people know what they need. You just have to give them the power and the will to say it and push them. We need to be the wind behind them, right? So anyway, Mass for News Alliance is a really cool thing that I'm really proud of. And I'm really proud to work with Andrea and Green Roots and Sunrise and all of the other organizations that need to be at the table. Thank you. Thank you, Campbell. Thanks for all the great work that 350 does. It's, it's just a very powerful force in our, uh, our political universe. And Sarah Amen, a coordinator at Green Roots, and Chelsea, um, when you Google environmental injustice, Chelsea comes up. Uh, and uh, Sarah and this incredible organization is there to rectify those historic injustices. So welcome. Great. Thank you. Oh, is this on? Perfect. Um, great. Thank you so much, Senator Markey, for inviting us here and your wonderful staff for um, coordinating this awesome event. I'm actually a Tufts alum, so it's really nice to be. Thank you. <laughs> so I was like so excited to come here during spring, spring, spring Fling weekend. It's such a fun time to be on campus. So I'm happy, really happy to be here. And thank you to my co-panelists, who I feel like I'm learning so much from. Is and it just, like, Spring Fling past. weekend right now? It is Spring Fling weekend right now. You're here on a good weekend. They did not invite commuters from BC uh, <laughs> over for that. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well. Well. Thank you to my co-panelists too. I feel like I'm learning so much from you all, and definitely admire the work that all of your organizations do. Um, so my name is Sarah. I'm the health equity coordinator at Green Roots, and I kind of come to environmental justice work through lived experience. I grew up in Chelsea. I still live there. I see and live and smell and experience the environmental justices that occur in our communities like every single day. And that's what's really brought me to my work at Green Roots. That's what's really brought me to environmental justice. I think one thing that I think about in terms of how Green Roots operates and what our work is, right, we're, we're thinking about environmental justice holist holistically, right? It's not just about the natural environment, it's the built environment, the ecosystems and entire structures that are surrounding people, their livelihoods, their, their opportunities to get jobs and clean housing, all of that has to do with environmental justice. And, um, so I really think that's the one thing that Green tries to think about, like what is the holistic way that we can view environmental justice and what are the organizing techniques that we can then do as an organization to bring people into the movement. So I think one thing that we've really been um, leaning towards is language justice in our communities, right? We know that communities of color in Chelsea and East Boston do not always, they're not always speaking English. We have to have our meetings interpreted into different languages. We have to have our documents translated. We have to really be encouraging folks to come into our spaces and encourage them to speak from the language of their hearts, right? To, and not only just accept it, but really encourage them to come in as their full selves. Um and I think other ways that we can bring, that we work to bring folks into the movement too, is like, how do we create events and spaces that that work for working families, right? Are we having all of our meetings during nine to five? Or are we using that time after work with food and childcare and making those spaces fun for people to be in, um, to bring them into the environmental justice movement as well? So we're engaged in a lot of different. Um, activities and work right now, um, the work that I focus on is the intersection of climate justice and health, like what is the way that the built environment um, can support people's health outcomes, that access to green space and cooling and things like that. Um, so those are some of the things that we're working on. I'm just really happy to be here with you all and be in this community and space with everyone. No, beautiful, thank you. Um, Sarah, thanks for all the work you do. And Congresswoman Presley and I were able to get the EPA to bring in air monitoring equipment over to um, Chelsea for the first time, but we did it in coordination uh, with Green Roots and uh, all of your work identifying these uh, historic um, 
toxic um, exposures that were occurring there. So thank you for that. And our, and uh, and next we're going to hear from Sophie Leggett, member of uh, Sunrise Movement Northeastern, and uh, behind the Green New Deal is the Sunrise Movement, uh, and uh, they are everywhere on campuses young people at all levels, and uh, we thank you so much, Sophie, for being here. So where are we now in the movement? Thank you so much for having me. Is this on? I can't yeah. tell. Okay. Um, yeah, so Sunrise is a national movement um, started by young people five or six years ago now um, with the primary belief that there is no transition to a greener world without workers and without there's no transition to a greener world if we're leaving workers behind. And so Sunrise's big movement is for green jobs and for a livable future, really focused on um, how the transition is going to affect the economy and um, real work in people's lives. Um, and so I am a second year at Northeastern University. I'm studying environmental science, as you might guess. Um, but Sunrise Northeastern does a lot of really focused community work. Um, we are involved with some national campaigns, but a lot of our work particularly is really focused on the university um, because universities are in such a unique position in terms of the climate crisis. Um, they not only are researching um, climate change and developing a lot of young people's worldviews in terms of climate and social justice, um, but they are institutions and Boston is home to a lot of universities, um, but Boston is also a working class, it's a union city. Um, and so Sunrise Northeastern focuses a lot on the ways that universities, particularly in Boston, are affecting the communities around them. And our work is based on the belief that universities could be anchor institutions that are really leaders in fighting the climate crisis. Um, we have a lot of um, academic capital, social capital, we have this positionality is really important and prestigious institutions, um, but a lot of the time we're falling short of the things that we could be doing to stop the climate crisis by investing in fossil fuels. Um, Northeastern has a huge gentrification problem in surrounding communities. Um, we have huge issues with how we treat our workers, and so Sunrise Northeastern is focusing on um, how we can imagine universities as institutions that are actual leaders and not um, making promises and just doing the research to fight climate change, but actually taking action and becoming institutions that are leading the fight against climate injustices. Um, and so Sunrise Northeastern is still relatively new. We were started a couple of years ago, um, but right now we're working a lot on creating a green NEU deal, um, little pun, um, but <laughs> so that's kind of our vision of the different aspects of the university that all work together to um, be more just and sustainable. So um, our food systems, our housing situation, our investments in how we hold our administration accountable. Um, and we're also partnering with a lot of other student groups. There's a lot of student activism on campus, and so we're, we see ourselves as sort of a group that bridges the gap between a lot of these different social issues and brings them together um, in our vision. So thank you so much for having me. Fabulous. So what I'm going to do is just ask one question and go back in reverse order for each of you to answer. You're organizers. You're all organizers. You know, you're out there. So given what you've seen over the last several years and what we are today, are you optimistic? Have you seen progress? Have you seen change? It's not enough, but why do you remain optimistic? Why do you stay um, in this fight? Uh, what is it that you're seeing out there uh, that gives you hope that we can ultimately win this battle? So we'll start with you, Sophie. What are you, what are you, are you seeing changes that give you a reason to be optimistic? Yeah, I'd say um, a, big, a big reason for me that I'm optimistic is the community um, in social and climate organizing. So I think that a lot of young people um, care a lot about different social issues and environmental issues. I feel like 
my art generation is very socially conscious, especially with environmental issues. We've heard time and time again that we are the generation to stop climate change. Um, and so young people care a lot. I see a lot of energy on campuses. I've part, we're part of the College Climate Coalition. We've met some amazing people at Tufts Climate Action. Um, and so I think I remain optimistic because young people care, but um, I think that more importantly because young people are able to build community around organizing. So I feel like young people are initially inspired, um, but there's a lot of also, this can be also very overwhelming, um, can cause a lot of burnout, um, and can make people really pessimistic, especially in within the frame of individual action for climate change. It can be really easy to feel like nothing that I do matters, why bother? Um, but I think that people remain optimistic when we shift away from that narrative of individual action and towards the collective and the community. Um, and so at Sunrise we're creating, like I said, a vision not of, not based in anger or injustice about, about what the university is doing and what's going on in the world, but around this vision of hope, as cheesy as it might sound, because that's what is really sustaining us. Um, because, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that anger um, and injustice can be these really important emotions to get us started, but they really easily lead to burnout. And so what really sustains us is building intentional communities um, and really making people feel like the world is something that's worth fighting for, um, not just because it's beautiful. I, we know that it's nature is beautiful. I grew up in New England, um, but because we have these communities and this culture that is what keeps humanity going and what's worth fighting for. And um, I think this is true for all organizing, but especially with young people who are figuring out what they want in the world and what they care about. Um, I think that the most important thing to me that keeps me inspired and keeps me going um, and optimistic about the future is that I have this community in organizing that has a vision of hope for a better world that we really believe in and that's what we can fight for. Beautiful, thank you. I appreciate it. Beautiful. And uh, you're over in Chelsea. What what makes you feel optimistic? Have you seen change and you think there's more to come? Um, yes, for sure. I think one thing that keeps me hopeful is like seeing the resilience and hope our community members have each and every single day. I think one really good example is our vaccine outreach initiative this past year, right? We know that Chelsea was one of the hardest hit communities across the Commonwealth in terms of COVID. Um, but right now, Chelsea is actually one of the highest vaccinated communities um, in the Commonwealth. And that's because of community organizing. That's because people have invested in places like Green News, like La Collaborativa, like Chelsea Black Community, all these organizations on the ground went door to door, signing people up for the vaccine, right? Talking to their community members, engaging with them. So I think that, yes, maybe there's a lot of injustices, but given the right resources and the right tools paired with the resiliency and just like the amazing like people in Chelsea and East Boston, we know that all together we can really solve a lot of issues. Um, so I think really I'm always inspired by our community members and they keep they keep me really hopeful um, in this fight. Thank you. And uh, Kabul. Well, I've been around a long time, so, uh, and I've seen a lot, and I, I, one of my favorite things to say is, like, what do the Crown and the IPCC have in common? They were both created under Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> it's like, so it's been a while, right? It's been a minute. Um, and I, uh, you know, I, I used to do um, door knocking for Save the Rainforest back when, like, Sting had this, like, big campaign around it. Um, you know, it was like a problem that's over there. Um, so, you know, but the environmental justice, uh, my, my roots in that type of community, um, as I spoke to earlier, um, you know, you never know what you can do until you're really back up, backed up against a wall. And then, you know, you just amaze yourself. And I am amazed every day by the organizing that is happening. And I know that it's cliche to say that hope is making a comeback, but I think it is. And I think that because everybody now is an environmental, uh, uh, or getting environmental degrees, or, or everyone is interested. It's like, it's, a, it's incredible. That was not the case when I was growing up. 
and it was not the case in the 90s. And you know, we were just dealing with constant polluters in the 90s, and um, you know, we weren't really thinking about the fact that our planet was going to heat to a point where we couldn't live here anymore. So um, hope for me is on the table. It's being served up every day in every neighborhood, in every coalition, in every community. And I finally feel like I'm going to be able to organize myself right out of a job very soon. And that's a good feeling. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, Andrea, you, you're part of the movement to kill the Springfield biomass plant, which was going to be polluting in the poorest part of of Springfield, and that just happened last year. So talk about your optimism and the, the progress that you're seeing. Yeah, I have, I have a couple. Is that on? Yeah, yeah? okay. <laughs> um, I have a couple things that uh, make me hopeful. I think the, the first is really, and I, a lot of people touched on this, is the membership, um, especially community residents that haven't been in the environment or have been in the environmental movement, but whose voices haven't been at the forefront for a very long time. Um, and so those are the black and brown communities that we organize in in, in, um, in our four chapters for neighbor to neighbor. And so I think that's probably been the most hopeful because it was a lot of that community organizing that did stop the biomass plant, um, that did stop the Mount Tom coal plant. Um, and our members really touched on the public health aspects of consistently having these polluting facilities cited in um, poor neighborhoods and BIPOC communities across the state. Um, and I think just the, the community organizing and the membership and having them tell their stories um, of many members who in Springfield don't open their windows in the summer because of the pollution and they have asthma um, and having their voices being very present in the biomass fight. So the members make me hopeful for sure. Um, and then I think the, the second thing that also makes me hopeful um, is how much environmental justice has been um, a term that's been used not only in Massachusetts, but nationally with President Biden setting up the White House Environmental Justice Council, which is the first time that we have really had um, environmental justice in every single aspect nationally. Um, and then also here in Massachusetts, uh, working with, with Green Roots and many others and co-convening the Massachusetts Environmental Justice Table and having Massachusetts pass its first statute on EJ um, that touches on citing issues and cumulative impacts um, and environmental injustices that have happened here in Massachusetts. So uh, that also makes me hopeful that the conversation is shifting when we talk about climate. We're also touching on EJ and it's not just mitigation or adaptation, but we're also really centering um, the communities that have been um, sacrifice zones for a lot of these polluting facilities moving forward. So those are, those are I think, the aspects that make me the most hopeful. And, uh, and thank you for all of your great work. Thanks to this panel for all the work they're doing every day. Not agonizing, but organizing. Uh, showing how victories are won, but only if people work together. And are we making progress? Yeah, we're making progress. We're making a lot of progress. Um, not as much as we want, but we've come a long way in a very brief period of time. The first Earth Day was in 1970. There was no EPA. So you can't run the EPA if it doesn't exist. That's only 1970. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no Superfund program until 1980, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, four weeks ago, want to see how far we've come since in a very brief period of time? I got to be one of the 50 votes to confirm an African-American woman, Katanji Brown Jackson, to be on the Supreme Court of the United States. I got to do that. And then have an African-American vice president of the, of the United States, a woman, come to break the tie because we had no Republican votes. We had to do it. But it, we did it. Okay? Not easy, but it happened. History, you know, as Martin Luther King Jr. used to say, the, the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. Uh, and... All of our hands have to be on that arc, bending it 
towards justice. And that's what we're doing. That's why we had this conference here today. Um, and that's why we have these great leaders up here, just to explain what is happening every single day in Massachusetts, but in organizations like theirs all across the country. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we can do this. We can ensure uh, that we create the millions of new union jobs again, reduce greenhouse gases, uh, but do so with justice for all communities across our whole country. So we thank all of you for everything that you do every single day. We thank Tufts University uh, for being uh, an incubator for change, for producing this incredible student body that goes out uh, to work to change the world. Uh, and I've just been so honored to be here with you today. And let's partner now to, uh, to take the next steps uh, towards having the United States be the leader and not the laggard, uh, so that we are the example for the rest of the planet. Thank you all so much for being here.